Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to Paris and to the Machine Learning Summit. It is very exciting to be here with such an international crowd of people covering a wide range of interests in machine learning. And I'm actually personally looking forward to spending these next two days with you, all of you, la crème de la crème of thought leaders in research in academia, in industry, and also the uh, thought leaders in machine learning. And finally, I feel very fortunate that we are able to do this event here in Paris. I'm French, but also in this beautiful Microsoft Le Campus. And I would like to introduce the person who enabled us to be here, Alain Crozier, who is the president of Microsoft France. Alain Crozier has been at Microsoft for almost 20 years now in uh, different roles, uh, business roles, financial roles, and it is in his role of president of Microsoft France that he is hosting us. Please, let's welcome Alain Crozier. Thank you, uh, thank you Evelyn. Uh, you know what? Uh, I am uh, I'm honored, but I'm also impressed. By, by this crowd. This is not a crowd that you know, I usually talk to, so I don't know what will come out of this summit, but I'm sure a lot of good things, okay? Uh, first of all, I want to, I want to thank uh, Evelyn and, and Chris uh, uh, that you saw in the, in, on the first slide to organize, to, to really put together a lot of efforts to organize this, uh, this event. Uh, we are very proud, as, uh, uh, as you know, uh, to host you here in Paris. Uh, not because it's Paris, okay, but because it's also, like Evelyne, it's, it's, it's my country. So when we, uh, when we had this opportunity, we said it has to be in Paris. Why? Because, uh, first of all, we have a, a, a long history. The Microsoft France organization has a long history to work very, very closely with the research and R&D uh, organization. The partnership we have uh, in France with organizations uh, like the INRIA, we, where apparently Michel is here representing, is very important for us. And uh, why did we work with that and why do we think it's important? Uh, at the end of the day, what will differentiate us one day, it's not by what we are doing today. It's by what we are going to do tomorrow. And when we see things like uh, machine learning, I can tell you this is what's going to bring us to the next level. This is what we're going to bring us on top of something. We don't really know why. Uh, you know what? I was in Toulouse 10 days ago in a big data conference. And I was uh, sitting in a round table with uh, a startup, somebody from uh, the CNIL, which is uh, for France, the organization that really control, you know, uh, privacy and things like that. But I also, uh, somebody from the UK government, uh, Mr. Bracken, who really is a digital guy for the uh, Cameron government. And we talked about that, and of course, you know, we said, oh, we have all those data, those tons of information. What do we do? What can we do uh, with those information? And today, every industry, private, public, is looking at doing something with those information. When I discuss with the banks, when I discuss with the e-commerce industry, when I discuss with the auto industry, when I, of course, also discuss with government, local government, at the end, we know that doing something, using those information, can really help you get uh, uh, ahead of, of uh, the crowd, the competition, and so on. It also helps you be more productive, increase your services to your people, private or public. And at the end, 
it's very important that, of course, you know, we, we work in this space. So when the discussion was to host this summit uh, in France, I, I really said, hey, it has to be here. And for the first time, the second time actually, we have here one of the large, let's say, summit organized by MSR. The first one was in 2011. This one is in 2013. I'm asking, I'm begging Rick, who is here, Rick, that, you know, in 2015, if you come, it's going to have to be in Paris again, okay? So I'm going to maybe welcome uh, Rick to come and talk to us, or maybe Evelyn is going to do the introduction. But I'm very, very proud, very honored. This is a great facility. And you said, well, yeah, it's a facility with an auditorium. Let me tell you two words uh, about this one. We receive 100,000 people in this building a year. 100,000 people a year. Are they customers? Not only. People from universities, local and state government, private sector, all kinds of private sectors. People who are customers, we want to see what we are doing. We have a bunch of uh, facilities, assets in this, in this building. One is, uh, of course, an innovation center, which is where we take the best and breed of our product and solution, put together, assemble those solutions, and propose great, great, great solution for our customers. We have a, a lab here. We have an MTC, which also is where we test the latest technology that, of course, the company and our partners are putting together. So this is a very, very highly technological space. And of course, you know, when it's highly technological, I think it's a great place for research and, and R&D people. So welcome again to France. And Evelyn, I give you the crown. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alain. So now we are going to look at some of the latest excitement in machine learning in our labs at Microsoft Research. And for that, we are very fortunate to have Rick Rashid, the Microsoft Chief uh, Research Officer. Rick oversees an organization of uh, over a thousand uh, people, including researchers and uh, engineers across the world and uh, researchers who are in technical staff who are working both in applied research and basic research in a variety of areas, including machine learning. And um, now for those of you who don't know Rick, there are three things you should know about him. So first, Rick is the founder of Microsoft Research. Microsoft Research was founded uh, over 20 years ago now. Second, Rick speaks two research languages. He speaks the language of research in industry in his role as a chief research officer at Microsoft, but also the language of research in academia. Rick uh, was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, and uh, there he published influential papers in a variety of areas, including computer vision, uh, operating systems, and communications security. Finally, the last thing, for those of you who were, at the, who were able to make the reception yesterday, yesterday and were able to talk to Rick, you probably already figured it out, what I'm going to, to say. But if not, actually Rick tells stories like no one else, even for technical staff. So I, we're going to be here for a treat and having Rick uh, talk to us now about uh, his topic on machine learning. Rick, please, let's welcome Rick. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you. Well, as the founder of Microsoft Research and the, the head of Microsoft Research, I want to extend my own uh, welcome to all of you. You know, the, this topic of machine learning has become incredibly exciting over the last 10 years. I mean, the pace of change has been, been really dramatic, and I think it's ex exciting to be able to get so many people from so many different areas, you know, here today to, to talk about it. Uh, for those of you, though, who are closer to my age, uh, you probably may remember a time when uh, 
you know, uh, machine learning wasn't necessarily held in such high esteem um, as it is held today. Uh, I could remember back in the, the 1970s uh, and uh, the early 1980s when uh, it, you know, people would commonly, of course then we tended to use the term AI to refer to a lot of what's called machine learning now, uh, or even machine intelligence. Uh, when they ran out of, of things they wanted to call it AI, they just changed the name a little bit. Uh, but back then, you know, there was a tendency to think about uh, AI as being an area that was probably best defined as a, a space where uh, people were working on problems that they had no idea how to solve uh, and no good ways of doing it. Uh, and the, the, the techniques and the ideas that were applied then uh, in terms of, of really being able to build expert systems or try to, to build systems that could, that could solve problems or learn were really built more on notions of, of, of uh, taking information from a single human or multiple humans encoding it into a set, some set of rules and then trying to apply that or by using uh, relatively simple techniques of, of pattern recognition. Unfortunately, those techniques didn't work remarkably well. They, they, they generated fairly um, suggestive results, uh, but they never really quite panned out. And probably the, the nadir uh, of that uh, era was the uh, fifth generation uh, project in Japan uh, which is a 10-year project which included a huge effort in, uh, in artificial intelligence. And unfortunately, the failure of that fifth generation project uh, really put a damper on a lot of people's ideas about what you could actually do in the field. And uh, you went through a period when it was both difficult to find funding uh, for some of the research projects, uh, but also I think people were generally discouraged. And I remember even within you know, Microsoft in the 1990s, uh, people, I think there was a large, largely held belief that machine learning was, was interesting as a topic, uh, but not particularly practical and wasn't likely to produce um, interesting results. Well, times have definitely changed. Today, you, you, sort of, you ask a little bit about what's really changed here. Uh, today, a, a lot of different forces have been coming together uh, to really transform what we think of as machine learning uh, and really change what machine learning can do uh, for us. Obviously, one of the key things that has changed is data. I mean, the reason that people built, you know, rule-based expert systems back in the 70s and 80s was often because they just didn't have enough useful information to get good results. I mean, there were statistically-based uh, machine learning technologies even going back to the 1960s. But the computers of that era could process a very small amount of information. And we didn't have a lot of good data uh, for a lot of the things that we wanted to do. And so instead, we relied on techniques that didn't require huge amounts of computation and didn't require a large amount of data. Well, that's changed. You know, as we've built larger and larger data centers, as we've collected more and more information, we now have the ability to process enormous amounts of information terabytes, petabytes, exabytes of data. Um, and we have the ability to gang together hundreds of thousands of processors in data centers that are linked globally together. So that's really changed what we can think of doing in machine learning. And it's given us ability to do things or tackle problems that we would never have looked at before. We've also learned, you know, come up with new ways of thinking about machine learning, new techniques. And people will be speaking about many of those during the day today and tomorrow. Uh, but that, again, it's not just the data that's driven the expansion of the machine learning area, but it's also a better understanding of what we're doing, a better understanding of the algorithms and, and the, the mathematics behind it. And uh, that's really changed the field as well. Something else that's happening right now is, is uh, this sort of new world of devices. You know, we're now, I suspect almost everybody here is carrying a cell phone. Uh, we have laptops, we have tablets, we have all sorts of, of devices now that are spread out in the world, GPS systems and in cars and planes. Those systems are turning the entire world into a vast data collection laboratory for computer scientists. We're collecting enormous amounts of information from all those devices. And again, that is changing how we think about solving problems. So where, you know, uh, 
not that many years ago, uh, it was difficult to say find a large amount of speech data to do uh, speech understanding systems. Now we're collecting huge amounts of speech information. Everybody that's using their phone um, and using voice uh, to um, do search or to activate various functions in the phone, using an Xbox, which is now being used heavily um, through its speech interface. All of those, those devices are collecting a huge amount of data. They're also creating a huge opportunity for machine learning because suddenly now we've got good reasons to try to build better interfaces. These devices have suddenly become more like us in, in the sense of having our senses. They know where they are. They can hear. They can see. They've got cameras. Uh, they have a sense of touch. They have a sen sense of acceleration and movement. And so now it, it gives us an opportunity to take all that information, integrate it together, and use machine learning to create a whole new category of interfaces and new ways of thinking about using those devices. Finally, this new world of, of large data centers and cloud computing has created an opportunity to create services built around machine learning that can do things for people that we would never have imagined doing before. So all of this is basically feeding into this growth of the field and really changing people's perceptions of the importance of machine learning uh, in the field of computer science. You know, it's, it's, it's funny to think back, you know, on the, the, in the 1980s uh, and, you know, the, the, the feeling that people had that, that uh, this artificial intelligence, machine learning was sort of cratering. Uh, and to, to realize now the amount of economic value that's, and the effect on people's lives that these techniques are creating. I mean, the search business alone is, is over $50 billion a year in revenue. Uh, for a number of different companies. The, you look at things like the Xbox Live service that heavily depends on machine learning techniques in order to do player matching, something called TrueSkill that came out of our research lab in Cambridge. You look at Xbox Connect that's changed people's perspe perspectives on what computers can do, how they can see. You suddenly now there's a device in, every, in, in, in anyone's home that can see them moving that know what they're doing with their arms and their legs, and that allows them to interact directly with, with uh, the computer system and with other players. Again, that's both changing people's perceptions, perceptions of what computing does, but at the same time, it creates a huge economic value. So Xbox Connect has helped Xbox continue to be the number one selling console in the United States. That's huge economic value to Microsoft, but just the Connect business itself is a multi-billion dollar business for us. Again, amazing change in what you think of systems being able to do. Uh, but you can also begin to see the idea of machine learning you know, solving critical problems in people's lives. Uh, so there's uh, some work that's been going on with our research lab in, in uh, Cambridge um, and with uh, Edinburgh Hospital, looking at using machine learning techniques uh, to recognize aggressive brain tumors in three-dimensional MRI scans. Uh, there's actually going to be there's a demo out in the demo booth area. Uh, you'll be able to see about that. Project Moondog is work that's being done by David Heckerman and his group in Microsoft Research, uh, working with the Wellcome Trust and looking at all of their data, their genetic information, um, and looking at uh, seven different diseases using a new machine learning technique called Fast LMM uh, for um, factor spectrally transformed uh, linear mixed models uh, that allows them to process. 60 billion uh, SNP pairs in a, in a genome-wide association study and to be able to, to find both existing relationships that people knew about between diseases and genetic information uh, in that database, but also they've discovered things that were not known about the relationship between certain genetic markers and, for example, coronary um, artery disease. Uh, again, really exciting new work a new way of, of doing a particular kind of machine learning task that's linear, and scales linearly in the, in the amount of data, and that dramatically reduces the amount of time required to uh, be able to process the information. It actually lets them look at much larger collections of people. And then, of course, you know, speech and, and uh, language translation, you know, I can remember a time when, when language translation, translation was pretty much a joke. I mean, you know, people would have fun with it. Uh, you know, you'd, you'd run your 
your text through the language translator, you'd run it back through, you'd, and you'd try to see what kind of funny thing it was going to say. Uh, now, a, a huge number of people are routinely using machine translation uh, to be able to read web pages in their own language or be able to proce process uh, information in their language that comes from another language. It's one of the fastest growing features, for example, in Microsoft Office, being able to, to automatically translate text um, and to be able to look at it. It's one of the fastest growing components of our Bing service, being able to translate uh, pages from other languages into your own. So this, th these things that used to be very poorly done, suddenly we've been able to do them much better than we've been able to do in the past. And that just changes our perspective on what's possible and what you can actually do. So um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm gonna uh, tell a little story associated with this. Uh, so late last year, I, I got to become personally the poster child uh, for a certain kind of, of uh, machine learning task. Uh, for a couple of years now, I've been uh, pushing our teams in Microsoft Research to um, allow me to get up on stage uh, in my uh, annual, we, we do this uh, uh, huge conference in China, academic conference every year, and uh, I wanted to be able to get up on stage and give at least a portion of my speech in English and have it automatically translated into Chinese. Now, two years ago, uh, when we first experimented with doing this on stage, uh, it really didn't work. I mean, it worked, I mean, it actually worked remarkably well. It just wasn't sufficiently reliable that you could put, you know, a, a Microsoft executive like myself on stage and expect the results to not be embarrassing, right? So, so we would get most, you know, most of what I would say right, and then it would produce something that was really embarrassing, you know, like, you know, a random reference to somebody else's product, for example, or, you know, a, a, an inappropriate comment of some kind. Uh, so, so we kind of nixed that particular uh, year's uh, demo. Uh, but right about that same time, about two years ago, uh, Dong Yu in, in our research group uh, in Redmond working with Alec, Alex Acero, uh, you know, came up with a way of using uh, what was uh, sort of emerging as a new way of doing neural networks, it was called deep neural networks, in order to process uh, speech and to be able to do better speech recognition. So for those of you that have been in the speech business for a long time, you know that, that you know, in the early days it was basically a pattern matching task and the systems were extremely fragile. Uh, with the work of, uh, of Kai Fu Li and, and Xiaowen Hong, uh, Xiaowen Han the, uh, in the late 80s with the Sphinx system, you, you began to use uh, statistical techniques, in particular hidden Markov models as a way of doing general purpose speech recognition. And, and really a huge improvement occurred during that period, and you saw dramatic improvements in, in our ability to do speech recognition. It was still the case, though, that, that those, are, those techniques kind of plateaued, and from the late 90s, really until just, re just in the last couple of years, uh, you were plateaued at, at something like 22 to 25 percent word error rates for general speech recognition. So, Re recognizing what I would be saying right now. Uh, that's not very good. I mean, one word out of every four being wrong, um, and, and usually being wrong in, a, in not necessarily a great way, uh, didn't really work well enough for most purposes. You could use speech recognition, and people were using it extensively for restricted domain tasks. Uh, and, you know, anybody that talks to their bank, or anybody that, that, that calls up any type of service, uh, or using an Xbox or using Siri, you know that you, you can get a much more, um, a, a, you know, much better recognition rates in more restricted domains. Uh, but for the general task, it was, it was not sufficiently good. But what, uh, what Dong Yu and, and uh, people in, both in our research lab in Redmond and in, um, in Beijing were able to do was to dramatically improve the recognition rates uh, for speech recognition uh, by about 30 percent, so a huge change. You know, there was a talk, I think it was actually a, a Google talk not that long ago, where someone talked about this being a 20-year you know, uh, improvement in, um, in speech recognition in this course of basically one, one discovery. Um, and today, pretty much all of the groups that do speech recognition, whether it's at Google, IBM, Nuance, Microsoft, you know, we're all now using these deep neural network techniques. So using that idea, 
uh, we revisited last year the idea that I could get up and perhaps uh, give my presentation, or at least part of my presentation, in English and have it translated into Chinese. And with a bit of a twist, uh, the team was also able to not only trans translate me into Chinese and, and have that come out in a Chinese voice, but have the Chinese voice actually be mine, meaning they took the, the spectral characteristics of my own vocal track and were able to use that. So I'm going to play you a short video, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about the story that goes with that. There's much work to be done in this area. But this technology is very promising. And we hope in a few years that we'll be able to break down the language barriers between people. Personally, I believe this is going to lead to a better world. So, so that was a particularly fun presentation because the audience, of course, didn't know what was coming. Uh, and you know, it, it, was, it was sufficiently stunning. We had an audience of about two or 3,000 Chinese students and professors there. It was sufficiently stunning to them that uh, I was told by some of my colleagues in the audience that they saw some of the, the students crying. Uh, that this, you know, this was su such a big change in terms of what they thought computing would be able to do for them. Uh, now, it turns out I'm evidently a really good speaker for speech recognition technology, because for the 45-minute speech that I gave, uh, the word error rate was about 7% uh, for that particular day. And the, uh, to put that in perspective, uh, you would expect a, a good human uh, to do real-time transcription with an error rate of about 2 to 4%, uh, depending on the individual and their, and their skill. Uh, so so it, was, it really worked remarkably well. Uh, but it wasn't without a lot of trepidation on the part of the team that was doing this for me. Because the idea of you know, sending up your, your, your boss's boss's boss uh, and putting them on stage and trying out something that had really never really been done before uh, and expecting it to actually work was a little daunting uh, even for them, even though they'd built the system. And I can remember um, uh, you know, Frank Side, who was the one who was actually you know, manning the machine uh, while I was, while I was uh, doing my speech. The night before, when we did a rehearsal, you know, his first comment to me was, well, if this doesn't work, do I get fired? <laughs> uh, and I said, no, 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 th th this is China. Your boss gets fired, OK? <laughs> if it was the United States, you'd get fired, OK? It's just all different, different, cultural, different cultural norms. Uh, but what's, it, what's, I think, been interesting, you know, both about this demonstration, but also really about the changes that are now happening in the field of machine learning, uh, you know, especially as we bring in new techniques like these deep neural networks, is this sudden optimism that some of the great problems of computer science, you know, whether it's, uh, it's, it's computer vision, which by the way is an uh, area I did my PhD thesis in, uh, whether it's, it's uh, speech recognition, whether it's machine translation, uh, that, that now we may actually be beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, that, that, that we may see, not just in our lifetime, but maybe in not very many years, many of those critical problems uh, be, be, be solved. And the last thing I'm going to mention, this is just really for your benefit, as, as uh, many of you are machine learning um, experts, is this isn't just about machine learning. This, ultimately, this is a, if we're going to make a great deal of progress in this field, it's because of cross-disciplinary work. It's because we're bringing in uh, uh, systems people and engineers to be able to help build out these very large-scale systems. It's because we bring in domain experts in particular areas um, that help us to tackle problems or understand the data or bring data into our, our systems to analyze or that give us new problems to solve. And so you know, I think as you go through the next, uh, the next day uh, or two, 
you know, that's something you should be thinking about as well, is that not just how you work together as a community, but how you collaborate and work with people you know, outside of the community uh, to be able to really create great systems. Thank you very much.